This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Fees and generous donations from viewers like you. I, I, um, uh, it's uh, 2.33 p.m. on June 16, 2020, and I'm calling the Finance Committee to order um, and uh, welcome all members of the committee. Dorothy Pam, I think, is the only one who's going to be a, uh, a few minutes late. We do expect her. The other members of the committee I will be introducing um, as we go along, but I want to first um, start by uh, putting up the uh, agenda um, on the screen as we talk. So to start with, um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18, this meeting of the finance committee is being conducted Require remote participation. Um, one of the things that we have to do under the um, requirements of the um, open meeting law is make sure that as I ask each uh, member of the committee to recognize, uh, to, to let me know I, they can hear me and they need to answer so that we can confirm that uh, they can be heard also. Um, so I'll start with uh, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Okay, and I don't think Dorothy's here. Um, and then we have three other members of the committee who are resident members and Sharon Povinelli. Yes. Mary Lou Talman. Here and mute me out. And um, Bob Hegner. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to just for a moment have the agenda on the screen so that um, everybody can uh, see it, including anybody who watches this from home uh, through Amherst Media. And Amherst Media, thank you for your participation in the meeting today. Um, what we're going to do is take this out of order a little bit. Um, I want to make sure that we get the two items that require the largest amount of staff participation and are new to the committee um, to come up early. So we will do the um, capital improvement plan, uh, capital improvement program, and the water and sewer rates if everybody is agreeable to that is the first two items um, and then come back to the other items later. The other thing that I want to note is item number five. There was a request to the Energy and Climate Action Committee to um, introduce themselves and their goals and what they see as uh, long-term budget needs that they might have. Um, it's not regarding the FY21 budget. I made a suggestion to them that either one of the next two weeks before the FY21 budget is released to us or after um, we're done with the budget, but I didn't uh, think that we wanted to spend the time on it during the budget discussions. They are not going to be participating today. Uh, the chair of ECAC was not available, so we don't have a new date for that, but it will be rescheduled. And I just wanted to uh, point out what it was. So um, with that, um, I think that what I'm gonna um, do is uh, get us back into um, general mode so that uh, we no longer have anything for the moment on the screen and uh, since Amy is, Rusecki is also net here now, as well as Guilford Mooring, who are from the uh, Department of Public Works and um, oversee the um, water and sewer, and, uh, sewer 
systems and they're going to speak to the rates. Um, I wanted to take those, that item up first, if everybody's agreeable to it, so that um, they can go on to do other, um, other work. Uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, our town manager. Paul, do you have anything you want to say first about water and sewer rates? No, I said last night that um, you know, this is our presentation on the water and sewer rates. Sean Magano and Guilford and Amy are all prepared and Sonia will provide support. I just want to note that our water and sewer rates are well below the state median, the state average, and uh, also below most of our neighbors uh, in our in our area. And while our increase is substantial, is sizable, 7%, 15%, uh, our rates are still substantially lower than what you would see in other communities in our neighboring communities. Okay. So with that introduction, shall I turn it over to Sean to uh, make the presentation that was planned and then uh, we can go to questions from there. I think Lynn has a question. Yeah, I just want to give you an update on Dorothy. Um, they just changed their servers and so she's going to try to call in. We may want to be looking for her in the attendee area. Okay. I'll keep an eye out. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay. no, right now she's not there, but uh, we will keep an eye out for that. Uh, so, Sean. All right, I'm going to share my screen in a second and go through some of the financials of each of the funds. Um, I think the best way to do it, unless you have alternatives, is I'll, I'll do the water fund first and then stop sharing my screen and we can probably talk about the water fund. And then after that, I'll do the sewer fund. Does that sound okay? That sounds fine. And just so that you know, uh, of course, we all had a presentation uh, on May 1st that we attended that was uh, with Ted and Howard talking about water rates, how they're calculated, mm -hmm. and um, different structures for water rates. I do have that available to share screen on if people uh, have questions that go back to that particular presentation, but it's not intended necessarily to come up today. Okay. Sean? All right, I'm going to share my screen now. I think, let me get this going. Okay, so I think it should be shared now and you should hopefully all see the first page. Um, so this is the high level summary of the financial situation with the Water Enterprise Fund. Um, it's organized a little funny, but I'll, I'll walk you through it just so you have a sense of what you're looking at. Um, so you have what was budgeted for FY20, what's being proposed for FY21, and then some projected out years after that. Um, at the very top, you have some revenue sources that are non-user charge revenue sources that are uh, earmarked every year. Um, and then below that, if we were going to use any of the reserves to support the budget, you would see an amount there, but you can see we don't have that. We have zeros across the board there. Um, then we get into the expenses. So the operating expenses um, are dropping a little bit for FY21, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, the transfer to the general fund is basically the indirect cost uh, that the enterprise fund pays to the general fund for all the services that Town Hall provides to the enterprise fund. Um, and that's just updated for this year. It dropped a little bit, but nothing um, significant. Uh, current debt is looking at the next year on the debt schedule for all the projects that have been approved from the water fund and just using those new amounts. Um, proposed debt, there is no new proposed debt for FY21, um, but that is where you will see a big impact in the out years when the Centennial plant comes online and we start paying the debt for that. And then below that is capital, and that's sort of like cash capital for JCPC, for those of you who are part of JCPC. It's sort of smaller capital items that we buy each year from the, from the enterprise fund, um, improvements to the water um, infrastructure vehicles um, that support the water fund and things like that. And, and we'll look, I'll show you the detail of what supports that number. Um, so based on the non-user charge revenues and then all of the expenditures that we're projecting for next year, that calculates a rate needed. And then looking at that rate needed, which for FY21 is 419, 
that's how we get to the actual proposed rate. Um, a couple other impacts to note, uh, if you look at FY20 and the usage, you'll see we're showing a usage down around 960. That's a moving target right now, and it's um, this year is because of COVID-19 and the uh, students at the colleges leaving um, much earlier, earlier than they usually do, and even some of the regular programs that happen throughout the year, it doesn't seem like they're occurring. Um, that number is much lower than what we expected. Um, and so that's going to create a possible uh, deficit for the year for FY20 that we'll have to absorb out of retained earnings. And we're projecting a continuing impact into FY21, not, not as substantial as in FY20, but we are projecting some impact in FY21 as well of, um, I think Mandy Joe called it the de-densification of the college and universities. I put that into Word and see, I was trying to see if that was a real word. I don't think it is, but, um, but it sounds good. So I was gonna use it. <laughs> um, so we're projecting about a million uh, hundred cubic feet for next year. Um, so with that rate of 420 for, F for FY21, that basically gets us to balanced um, with the expenses that we're projecting. And I'll go through a little bit more about the expenses. Um, so it is a, a substantial rate increase, but we have made several adjustments on the expenditure side in the water fund and even more so in the sewer fund um, to even get it down to that point of 420. And one thing I'll just note, um, you'll see down at the bottom, the retained earnings. So going into FY20, the retained earnings number was 2,062,679, um, which is roughly 45% of, of the budget. Um, but we are expecting there to, that number to drop um, by a significant amount uh, for FY21 once we see the full impact of the colleges and uh, the university and the, and the students not being there. So this next slide is um, looking at the expenditures. So I'll start with personnel. Personnel is going up um, about $30,000. Those are the regularly scheduled increases um, for the staff that are paid out of the enterprise fund. Um, right below that is the operating, operating expenses and those are going down about 30,000. And that's a combination of some reductions in health insurance costs, um, an increase in the pension cost for retirement, and then a, a increase to electricity um, that uh, Guilford can explain a little bit more about. But with the Centennial plant um, not online, it's, our electricity costs are projected to come in lower. And then if you keep going down, capital is where the most substantial reductions are to the water fund. Um, and, and there's a slide at the very end that gets into the detail. But originally, the capital uh, was projected approximately 200000 a little bit more. Um, for FY21, but we have pared that down to about $83,000, um, and it's a drop of a little over $100,000 from the year before. And then debt, again, we'll see on the next slide, that is the, the next year of actual debt uh, payments that we have to make. So this is a schedule of our debt. So the top half is the current debt, so you can see the runoff on that, and when some new things are projected to go online. Um, the big one down below is the Centennial Water Treatment Facility that um, if it goes as planned, the, the first year of debt payments will be in FY24. So aside from the impact of COVID, one of the other things that we are, for our long range planning, is we have the rate has to be able to support that debt payment um, by the time we get there in FY24. And we wanna be conscious of keeping it artificially low and then having a huge spike um, when we get there because that might be more difficult than a gradual increases to get to that point. And if you look again, if you look at that summary sheet, you'll see that projected debt start to come into that summary sheet in FY24 and you'll see the cost start to rise. And then this is the snapshot of capital. So um, there was, for FY21, there was originally a truck in there that we have deferred. Um, the water system improvements, I believe, was originally around 100,000, and that's been reduced. And the water system improvements, um, I believe, was around 50,000, and that's been pushed off as well. Um, with, obviously, input from Guilford and Amy um, about being able to do that for a year. And then, again, future capital borrowings, you'll see the well number four replacement, which is coming up next year and then ultimately the Centennial Water Treatment Facility, which is FY22. 
So just to recap, um, to, before we even thought about the rates, we looked at what we could reduce from the operating budget. Um, we looked at electricity, we looked at staffing, um, and we looked at uh, the capital. And so we took out what we felt we could and then looked at what rate would be needed. And that's where we got the 419. And so I will stop sharing the screen for a moment and turn it back to you, Andy. And you're muted still, Andy. Actually, it was a good thing I was muted because the police officer arrived with the book for me and my dog started <laughs> barking when you were talking. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, one thing that I had is uh, on the bottom of that first slide, there was the, uh, I think, the, the retained earnings equivalent to the reserves for the fund. And I was trying to get a better grasp of the amount that they were being reduced over the next, um, over the 20 and 21 years from the amount that we'd started with. Yeah, so um, the retained earnings to start FY20 was the 2 point, or the 2,062,000. Um, for FY20, there's still a lot of variables, so this number could um, go up or down. Uh, some amount, but it's we, we do anticipate the direction is going to be down overall. Um, we're thinking about a five hundred thousand dollar reduction to that retained earnings for FY twenty, and, and a lot of that is dependent on the consumption that we get from the college and universities. Um, March consumption was way down because the, I think they left about halfway through March. April and May continue to be significantly down from where they normally are at this time. And when when your consumption's down, it's good for the water supply, but it's bad for the amount that we can bill um, and, and the revenue that can be generated for the enterprise fund. And so I think um, Guilford can speak to this a little bit more. I think he's starting to see the production start to pick back up a little bit for June and get back to maybe a normal level. But um, on the billing side, at least through May, um, it's down quite a bit. And so that's, that's the cause of the reduction in FY20. And for FY21, if, if we hit our, our projected consumption, um, of a million hundred cubic feet, then there won't be any more impact on the retained earnings. It'll actually go up $12,000, um, which is relatively basically a break even. Um, if our consumption comes in under that million for FY21, then we could start seeing another situation where we have a deficit. If it comes in higher, then things could turn more positive. Um, but it's another one of those variables, just like the operating budget that until we know the plans of the university and what that's going to look like, um, even the schools and other um, other things going on in town, um, it's going to be a moving target trying to pinpoint what our consumption is going to be next year. Okay, um, I have one follow up question on that, but before I do, um, Athena Dorothy is now in the attendee group, and can she be brought in? I'm, I can't bring her in as a panelist while she's on the phone. So Dorothy, you'll just have to use that star nine button on your phone to, to raise your hand and then Andy can recognize you. Andy, I'll try and keep an eye out for her hand raised in the attendee side. Okay. And uh, the, the follow up question I was going to ask is, do we have any um, guidance that um, as to what is the ideal percentage or number to have for the retained earnings and at what point do we have to start factoring in a plan to rebuild? Um, that's a great question, Andy. So I've actually been looking at some other um, communities and online about um, what the, the guidelines and the, and the financial policies are around their enterprise fund. And most um, that I've seen recently are around between 10 and 20% as sort of the minimum reserve level that you'd like to have. And many of them speak about if you have large infrastructure projects coming up in the future, even getting up above that. So R seem to be in a good range where they are now, um, but it is something that we'll have to keep an eye on if next year's consumption starts to come in lower um, we'll have to consider what we need to, uh, a plan to rebuild the reserves going forward. Okay, because uh, that reserve number has uh, always been a difficult subject with one of our enterprise funds, mm -hmm. the one that Guilford doesn't like to talk about too much, but. Uh, money. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be a future item. Uh, in any event, uh, Athena, do we need to do something in order to, because we can't confirm Dorothy as a member, as being able to hear us and be heard and count. Oh, I'm hearing. Attendance. Oh, you are. Okay, I'm, okay how do I do? Okay, so, see, um, so, okay, yep, so just, I, I allowed her to talk, but Dorothy, I'm going to mute your microphone. And if you, if you have a comment or question, then you can use the star nine to raise your hand. Okay. I raised my hand just to cut, check in. You see, I did star nine and we I can raised see my your hand. hand. We can see okay. it. So, okay. So I'll, I'll, then, then you can, then you can mute me. I don't have anything to say, but that means I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, I let the minutes show that we now have um, all members of the committee present and Dorothy has uh, now joined the meeting. Um, so Kathy, you, um, you had a, your hand up. Kathy, you're still muted. I'm doing it the easy way. I'm just going to hold the space bar down. Um, it may, I don't know whether everyone did a printed copy of what Sean just showed, but it might be good to put that back up, Sean, because I have a couple questions um, on different lines. Um, Okay, so Andy just asked one of my questions on the retained earnings. Um, I wanted to know what the um, budgeted other revenues are, because they're helping this. And I went back to last year's budget book, and I didn't see them, but a lot of things in this. So it's right under budgeted charges from, from, re from user charges. Then we get 210, 210, just one number. Where, is, where does that come from? Yeah, I'll let Sonia or Guilford speak to it. It's it's non-user charges, so it's fees and I think um, revenue from liens and things of that nature, but I'll let them speak to it. I can speak to that. It's um, connection fees, water liens, interest and late fees, grants, if there are any, and miscellaneous. So it just, so you pegged in 210 all the way across because it stays it's kind of stable and it's hard to predict. Is that what? Yeah, it's a placeholder. Okay. Yeah. And then, my, so then my other question, and I'll go from this sheet back to debt. Um, the way you've got the rates um, coming up 7.7, .7, I did the rate increases all the way going across. And there's, well, you can see it visually here, um, you know, a, the 7.7 seven, and then something like that again in 2022, then not even a percentage point um, in 23, and then a jump by 20% in 24, and then another jump. So I'm just wondering whether these are just um, tentative for right now is part of the question because there's a jump in one year. And then when I went and looked at the debt table, when, the, um, when we're paying off the study for Centennial and Centennial starts coming online, there's a jump in the debt, which you'd expect, but it's three times in terms of the debt payments. It's a multiple of three off of what we were paying before. So I don't know if I thought out five more years, um, you know, are we back to getting, you know, 4% or something like that, or do we have to have some more jumps as we're, you know, so I'm trying to think of it interactively with Andy's question that if, we don't get lucky in 2021 and we pull down more of the reserves, then we don't have anything to fall back on to pay the debt. So then we have to pay with the rates. Um, so this is where I just add, I just did all the debt service charge and divided it, you know, like from the beginning to the end. And that's where I get it was about a multiple of three. So we're up at a pretty hefty debt charge when Centennial comes along, about a million bucks. Um, so it's interactive with, do we need to worry about the reserves so that we can smooth out the rate more or do some of the rates need to go up a little faster in the first three years? And then what happens to 26 through the other? Or is it kind of smooth out there? I don't need to know exactly what it is. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so the, the rate, so there's two rates. If you look on this first screen, there's the rate needed and then there's the actual proposed rate. So beyond FY21, you can kind of ignore the actual proposed rate. That's gonna be the plan that we bring to you every year. Um, 
the rate needed is is the one to actually look at in terms of if these are the expenses and, and we keep this trend going forward, our whatever rate we uh, the council approves is we'll have to cover this amount essentially. So uh, Sean, Sean, can you highlight that with your cursor what you're looking at? Uh, I think yeah. so. So these are this is what is needed to break even in the fund going forward, and this factors in the centennial plant debt payments um, and the operating budget going up a little bit each year and things of that nature. Um, so we can the, the council can decide to space it out differently in order to have it be a more a smoother glide to where it needs to be ultimately to pay the, the debt for the centennial plant. Um, and down below, you'll see sort of a possible plan, but that's again, it's just sort of a, um, our thinking at this point. Um, and I think your other question was about the debt. So the debt spikes when the, the in the first year, I the way it's set up right now is it's sort of the, uh, an initial spike when the centennial plant debt starts to be paid and then it's going to be a declining, um, payment from there. So you'll see it spike in FY24. And then it'll start going down a little bit each year um, over the next, I believe, 30 years. Um, so in, it should start to smooth out at that point, unless there's other capital projects that pop onto the radar or other debt-funded capital projects <laughs> after that. Um, and the debt, just to confirm, yeah, it's, um, yeah, 30 years for the Centennial plant. And some of it, like the well number four, will be paid off even sooner. So when that drops off, the, the debt will drop off a little bit. And some of these other ones will have, I can, I don't have the full payment, but some of these other debt obligations will drop off um, at some point after FY26 as well. Can I just stay on this page? Cause that was the other question I had while I'm, um, you've, you've put in 4% um, and uh, kinds of interest rates for the new debt. Um, and um, you and I had a quick conversation, you know, a couple of weeks ago right now, you can do much better than that with municipals. I mean, I don't know what it's going to look like over the next couple of years, um, but uh, a big chunk of this debt repayment is interest, not principal. Right. So I, I did have a general question because I know the town always does it in a way that it's a declining payment. And I'm guessing, but I don't know when, when we were in a period of pretty high interest rates, it made sense to pay the principal off as quickly as possible so you could avoid if we're in a world if we stayed in a world with two percent going out 20 years um would we ever want to consider going out to a more steady rate each year because we're getting such cheap money so that's a, a more general question but these rates compared to what we, one could get if you were going out right now are on the high side so we may be on the high side with the debt projection yeah, we typically try to be conservative, especially when it's something that's not going to be borrowed for um, two or three years from now. Um, but you're right, if they come in lower, then the, these numbers will be adjusted for the actual, um, the actual debt schedule. And we can work with our financial advisor to, to figure out the most advantageous way for the town to structure the debt going forward. Um, this is to give you an idea of what, these, what the impact is going to be of these, of these new debt obligations in the future. I have one more question, but I'm going to let others jump in because it's on a slightly different topic. Okay, Pat, you had your hand up. Oh, thank you. Pat, I think you muted yourself by accident. I muted myself. I'm sorry. Um, I'm looking at the uh, impact on debt for Centennial on the $11 million, and it just in a general way, uh, how is this going to affect borrowing uh, on all of the other town projects? How do we, how are these balanced? Um, in terms of, so there's a couple things we have to keep in mind. Um, the debt ceiling, I'd have to double check. I'm not sure if the debt of the enterprise fund is subject to the same debt ceiling that we have to think about for non-enterprise fund debt. Um, but even if it was, um, we were so far below that debt ceiling with what we were looking at last time um, that it shouldn't have a huge impact. Okay. Because um, the main thing was that we found out last time with the debt ceiling is that MSBA funded um, projects, um, the school related debt is not subject to our debt ceiling. 
Um, so when you take the school out and you're just looking at the library, the fire station, the DPW potentially, um, or potentially all of them, um, we were still quite a bit below the debt ceiling. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Sean, I'll add that um, a lot of these projects for water and sewer fall into the um, outside the debt limit, so they wouldn't affect the debt limit at all. Okay, thank you. Kathy, did you have follow-up? Um, as, as Andy mentioned, we had the um, sort of an educational seminar a month or so ago on different ways one could set rates um, if we wanted to, that we could have a residential rate versus a commercial rate where the commercial rate was set higher for big major users like a UMass so we could not hit the small businesses. If we wanted to consider that, um, I, I was wondering at the timeline, because um, we had offered to get Guilford some, here are some possible scenarios that we might be interested in. And he said, if we did that, then he could generate a, if you did that, this would be the impact of it. So if we wanted to do something like that or, or decide whether we wanted to, when should we be asking sending something to you so we could have a discussion in the event we would want it to apply for FY22, you know, or for FY23, you know, as the centennial is coming on and rates are jumping up, if we wanted to protect residents, some, you know, homeowners a bit more. So I just need to know, like, would that have to be done in the fall um, so that you could think of the next year, how much in advance? Actually, if you did it sooner, like once you set the budget in August and you resolve, stop all the budgets or resolve the 21 budget, you did it right then after that meeting or right after that time period, that would be to give us the most time to talk about it. So the earlier, the better. So I think there were, I'm not sure which other counselors were interested. Some, so if we got you a, um, a memo that reflected more than just one set of ideas on a, you know, we, we, we just figure how, how to do this, Lynn. You know, we could do it in a finance committee meeting and then we could begin that discussion then. Yeah. I would suggest we start that in a finance committee meeting and bring it to the full council. Okay. I think that it would be better to start in the finance committee first so that it's not quite as wide a viewership uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that right now, universities in a very difficult financial position and um, whether our discussing this might cause them to make decisions that would pull them away from our water system, which would be contrary to our interests. Um, the other- would, Yeah, it would be alarming, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And, and the other thing that I've, I wondered about with this rate discussion, and again, it's not something for today. One of the reasons that Ted and Howard had said that communities should consider block rates really is not geared, as far as I could tell, necessarily towards those large scale users, but is really doll users to try and encourage conservation. Uh, people just uh, watering their lawns excessively and having a financial consequence to that decision, which is a homeowner question. That aspect of block rates, um, we need to have an idea as to whether um, the state is going to require us to move to that kind of a rate structure and at what point and what it would uh, begin to look like so that we can gain some understanding of it in advance. So I don't know if uh, Guilford or Amy have any um, indication as to when we might have to start thinking about that. Thinking about what the state's gonna require, no. I mean, I think we still have probably another year before we um, get our permit. Um, but we we are required to give UMass a uh, projected water rate memo by January. So if we started in August talking about this, we'd have until January to kind of work it out so we could 
preview it with UMass unless we decide not to preview it with UMass at that time. That's why I probably said that the timing might also be that we didn't think of it for 22. We might think of it for 23 or 24 when the, um, and I'm partly linking it to when you presented Centennial, we had those earlier studies that the extra use, the increased size of UMass was one of the reasons we needed increased capacity for water. You know, so they were, um, well, clearly if they weren't here at all, we would be using this but it was, you know, so the, it was not just a marginal cost, but it was a fixed cost impact on us because we needed another plant or another processing plant. The way I think about um, that extra amount of their growth. Um, I think about it that way, and I, but I also think about it the fact that we were trying to protect one of our water source areas because if we did bring Centennial back online, we would lose our permitting for that section of water that comes from mm -hmm. the Pelham watershed and the, um, it was protecting that water source was part of it. Uh, Lynn, you had your hand up. Yeah, well, I find this interesting. I, I have to say, I don't think you're gonna see the university stabilizing for at least a year. Uh, whether or not they're going to see the projections of increased in enrollments, I think is completely out the window. Uh, all of the assumptions they were basing that on are gone. And uh, I really don't believe that um, the numbers that you would be dealing with that are past numbers are of any use to us at this point. So until you get stabilized numbers, I don't see how you can do a model. Interesting. So, um, other questions about water, because otherwise uh, we then should switch to the other enterprise fund. Okay, Sean, you wanna? I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so this is set up the same, so I won't go through the organization of it, but um, same thing at the top with the other revenue sources. Um, the sewer fund in a, is in a little bit rougher shape um, compared to the water fund, and that's because the consumption isn't the same level as what water consumption is. Um, you'll see, I'll, sh I'll show it when we get down to it, but um, whatever water consumption is, sewer is roughly 85% of that, because um, not all water that gets pulled out of goes through the meter, ultimately it goes down the sewer. It could be watering grass or doing something else where it doesn't actually return. Um, so there's a little bit bigger impact on the sewer fund. Um, so there is, we are proposing using some of the reserves um, from the sewer fund to support this year's budget as sort of a one-time bridge to get us through. Um, and that number is 158,652. If you go below that, you'll see the operating expenditures, um, which are going down pretty significantly and I'll explain what that is. Um, there's the transfer to the general fund, uh, which is the indirect cost again for administration or for, for town, town hall staff. Um, and that's also being reduced. We um, reduced that amount a little bit from what it normally is. Again, as sort of a temporary bridge to get us um, through the next year or so. And the expectation is that will go back up to where it normally is. But um, when you see, these are all adjustments that we have uh, implemented first before looking at the rate because the rate increase, again, is sizable even with these adjustments. Um, current debt going on uh, with proposed debt zero, but you'll see the new proposed debt coming online in FY23. Uh, capital, we did reduce a little bit as well. That's the cash funded capital, went from 120 to 100. Um, so if you go down to the rate needed, the rate needed uh, for FY21 is 460, and that's exactly what we're proposing. Um, below that, so for FY21, for the water fund, we propose, we're projecting a million hundred cubic feet for consumption, and the sewer, when we updated basically how much of the water consumption ultimately comes back through the sewer, um, that number was updated for FY21, and it's been uh, pegged at 85%. And so that generates to 850,000 
uh, units of consumption for the sewer fund. So with that times the rate, that will get us to a break even for FY21. Uh, the retained earnings for the sewer starting uh, the, at the beginning of FY20 was 2,147,683. Just like the water fund, we are projecting a deficit in FY20 because of the uh, consumption and the projected units coming in lower than what we originally had based the budget on. And, uh, but going forward, again, we project that to stabilize if our units, if the consumption comes in where we are, we're projecting for FY21. So this is the, again, the breakout of expenditures. So on the personnel side, it's going up a little bit um, for the contracted salary increases. In the operating side, it's going down quite a bit, and there's a few things that make up that decrease. So there is a, every enterprise fund has an OPEB contribution that uh, reflects the staff and their, their future retiree benefits um, and the costs associated with those benefits. And so similar to the general fund where we had to reduce the OPEB contribution a little bit, um, we are proposing a reduction of about 100,000 to the OPEB contribution in FY21. So I think it was at 150,000 to start and it's gonna be brought down to 50,000 uh, for a contribution. And, and again, the hope is that this is temporary when consumption stabilizes, we can bring that number back up. Um, the other large drop was the indirect cost. So you can see down at the bottom right here was 377 and we lowered that by about $100,000 um, for FY21 and we hope that we'll, we'll bring that back up in future years with consumption stabilizes, but it was a, it's another reduction that we can make and we're able to absorb on the general fund side um, on a temporary basis. Capital was brought down 20,000. I'll show what that was, what makes up that amount on the last slide. So similar to the water fund, uh, this is the debt schedule. So we have our existing projects up on the top and there are two larger projects coming up in the future. Um, the gravity belt thickener is projected to start, the debt payments are projected to start in FY23, and that's a $2.3 million project. And the reuse water is 5 million, um, and that's also projected to start in FY23. And there may be some additional revenues that come out of the reuse water piece of this that can help out in the future. I'll let Guilford speak to that. Um, but this is the, the expenditure side of that project. And then lastly, the sewer fund capital. So the, I believe there was a truck, I think there was a truck here as well. Um, no, I don't think there was, sorry. Go for it, you may have to uh, remind okay. me reduced here um, on the capital side. There was a truck that was taken out and collection system improvements and treatment system improvements were both at 100,000 and we cut those in half. Okay, so we brought it back down. Okay, thank you. Um, so we did trim out, pare down the capital and the sewer fund just like we did on the water side um, and left just certain amounts that we feel like we're going to need for FY21. And Andy, I'll leave this up on the screen, but... Um, yeah, why don't you leave it up for a minute okay, and... Uh, so I was going to ask you to do a couple of things. Um, one is uh, for those who are unfamiliar with how our uh, enterprise funds are structured um, to explain what the um, general fund uh, transfers are, what the purpose is and what it's compensating, how it compensates the general fund. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a quick overview and then I'll let Sonia talk about the specifics. So um, all, you know, all the enterprise funds receive support from different departments um, that are paid from the general fund. And so there's a calculation done each year for all the enterprise funds um, to generate an indirect cost and meant to reflect the services that the enterprise fund receives. Again, they're indirect because they're hard to quantify, um, but we do a calculation each year and the enterprise fund will make that payment to the general fund. And so in, in turn, it helps lower the cost in the general fund because it provides an offsetting, um, an offsetting funding source. 
Okay. And the other thing, I the other thing I was, um, go down to the very bottom where you have the uh, gravity belt thickener. There's two um, right there. Oh, wait a minute now. So, There was um, one other thing at the bottom where you uh, had a uh, oh, reused water, that's what it was, um, to explain what those two large um, items are and when the commitment was made to them. Gilford, do you want to weigh in on that one? Sure. So the, the gravity belt thickener is actually a piece of equipment that's in the treatment plant now. Um, what the wastewater plant does is take the waste, it processes it, it uh, discharges a clean water, and then it also makes a waste, a sludge waste. Um, there's a device called the gravity belt thickener which takes this sludge waste and thickens it to uh, about 8% solids, 6 to 8% solids. And then that waste is, is trucked off to the disposal site. Um, the, the, the belt we have now is well over 15 years old, it's about 20 years old. Um, we've been having some problems with it, so we need to re put in another one. So we're putting in a brand new one and keeping the old one as the backup. So this is actually uh, this is actually an equipment replacement. It's nothing new in the system, it's nothing, it's just a re replacement of the existing equipment. Um, the reuse process is a process that we've been doing with UMass for about 15, 16 years now. Um, we just right now provide water to them and then they treat it in a treatment train and then they use it on campus. Um, it was always envisioned that as this process grew that it eventually would come to the town to manage and that we would treat our effluent water and clean it up a little more and then give it back to you or sell it to UMass, not give it, sell it to UMass and then they would use it for the processes they want to use it for. Right now, they use this water for boiler water, boiler water feed water. They use it for chill, chilling water and then a little bit of irrigation. So this is water that allows us not to use potable water to do things that we don't need potable water for um, on the water side and allows us to save our potable water for actually those uses. And I'll just add that the, um, the interest rates, they're zero here because the decimal formatting was messed up, but it's, but the interest rates for both of these is 5% in the projection. Now remember the gravity belt thickener was uh, something was done by the former town meeting um, as in making a commitment. I assume they both were and I just don't remember the other. Well, the the last, one of the last town meetings voted the money for the engineering design for the gravity belt thickener. But so we haven't actually uh, made the commitment yet on the, the, the equipment itself. No, we're still in the, the design process and we'll be done probably fall and we'll be ready to actually start installing. We'll be ready to bid it out in the winter for a, a spring summer construction if we're ready. So we'll just come back to the council to authorize the debt. Uh, in this budget, in the well, in the full budget, you'll get there'll be a, an item for the debt for the reuse and for the gravity belt thickener. Okay, so we can save it until then. For further discussion, I'm uh, recognizing Kathy and Lynn as having raised hands. So, Kathy. Okay, I I think Guilford was starting to answer that as I read this page and look above for where you've said future debt. Um, the only debt we see right now in terms of the rate computation is for the design of the belt thickener. We don't yet see, I'm at, trying to ask this as a question, am I correct? We don't yet see the impact of the actual equipment and the reuse water. So that's correct. And, and if we saw them, what year would they Given your planning cycle, what, when would they hit in terms of an additional debt in the sewer fund? What what year would it be? We're thinking it'll be 23. 
it'll, it's going to be, it'll be at least a year and a half probably of construction to get this installed. So it'll be 23 when the first debt payments probably show up. So then we should think of the 23, 24, 25 um, user charges needed, rate needed. Those, if those do not in any way yet reflect this additional debt. So they will be higher unless we have a lot of reserves that can avoid it. Is that correct? No, it's not. Um, okay. Once we work out a, uh, what UMass is, what UMass and us, well, what we're willing to sell and UMass is willing to pay for the reuse water, there'll be a new revenue stream from the reuse water coming into the sewer system right then. Would just be the gravity about thickener that would affect the rate then? Correct. Okay. And that, and that is not in the current rate yet. I mean, the, no, it's not current rate, it's the 23, 24, 25 rate. Correct. Okay. What is the uh, thing that Sean just highlighted? Can I chime in here? Yeah, go ahead, Sonia. So, um, Guilford, it was my understanding that the um, that the debt was not going to come in play for the gravity belt thickener until 23. However, and it wouldn't show up in the budget until 22 as a borrowing authorization. Uh, so no, it, need, it needs to show up, in, show up in this budget. It needs to show up in the 21 budget. We'll be done with design in this year and we need to move forward. Okay, It'll well, that's, this year. that's news. And Andy, what I'm highlighting is, so we do have the, the increased uh, debt payments from those two projects um, projected here. So the, the impact on the rate, you can see in FY22 to FY23, when that new debt goes in, um, you can see the big impact on the rate needed. Uh, now, if there's a new revenue source, once we figure out how much and what that new revenue source looks like, um, that will either, it'll either be considered a user charge, uh, or it'll probably affect the user charge side, and we have to put a new line in here but whatever that revenue is projected at will help um, lower what the rate needed is for everybody else. Sean, I thought Guilford just said we, the, the um, thickener equipment is not yet in these, you know, when I looked at that um, other sheet that showed new debt, it only showed the design debt. It didn't have um, anything called the thickener, the machine itself. Yeah, and so look at this 646 right here in the total proposed debt service. Um, that shows up right here. So both, so this does capture everything in the out years. What I think, I don't, I may have heard Guilford wrong, but I thought what he was saying is that neither of those are factored into our current rates um, because the, the debt hasn't begun. So our current rates don't reflect um, that debt, but the rate down here in the, when we're kind of forecasting out into the future, um, this 555 that out in FY23, this does include the estimated debt payments for those two projects. Okay. Lynn? Uh, first of all, thank you for that clarification because I didn't, wasn't quite sure how I heard it. Um, you said in the water presentation, and now I'm gonna ask the same question in the sewer, obviously uh, usage, et cetera, went down in March, but you said for water, it's starting to return to what would be a normal looking June, I gather, is what you were saying? Yeah, Guilford, Guilford sees the production side before I sort of see it on the, the billing side. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll let Guilford speak to what he's seeing in, in terms of June on the production side. And I, so my question is the same for both water and sewer. How do they compare to previous Junes? So we, we build a sewer based on a percentage of water usage. So if water usage comes back up to what where our normal usage is, our billing for sewer will be back at that normal rate as well. So are we seeing an increase use on water and sewer? We are, we're seeing, we're back to normal. Our normal production of water is about 2 million gallons a day. And that's okay. what we're seeing. And that's based what we base our billing on both those on. And that would be normal compared to last June. That's normal compared to a summer for Amherst, yes. Yeah, got it. Okay, and then my other question really also goes back to um, something you said with water, and then I think I heard it again here, and that is that you're paying less out of here 
maybe it was for retirement. I can't remember where, but it's because it's coming, the make, making it up from the general fund. So I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, it's a little bit different. So this isn't the case in the water fund, okay. um, but in the sewer fund, this line here, transfer to the general fund, um, in, which represents indirect costs. Yeah. So in FY20, you can see it was 377. We've dropped that down to 280. Um, so we still are calculating the full indirect cost uh, that the enterprise fund owes the general fund. Um, okay. but we're basically forgiving a portion of it um, on a temporary basis. And then, and then once we get through this sort of temporary um, consumption impact due to the COVID-19, um, we'll bring it back up to where it's supposed to be. So, and just one final question, it's really around our retirement uh, reimbursements. And are we, with these enterprise funds, are we in a similar situation as we are with the overall general town fund where we're actually ahead of many towns in terms of their payback? Yeah, the enterprise funds, I don't know about how we compare to other enterprise funds, but my understanding is that the enterprise funds have actually been funding their full um, ARC, which is the, I yeah. won't get the acronym right, but the annual required contribution or actuarial something contribution. Um, they're actually funding what they're supposed to each year to keep the, keep the liability from growing even bigger. Um, but this year, we're not funding at that yeah. water at least. In the sewer, or not in water, we're keep leaving it alone. In sewer, we're reducing it by hundred thousand. Okay. Yep. okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm looking to see if there are other questions about um, what we've heard so far regarding the rates. Because if I don't see any, there's one other item. I don't know if you have it, Sean. I have it on mine, but if you have it, um, when that is the proposed order for water and sewer rates. Um, that I don't have. Um, not readily available, at least. Okay, I can um, take a look to see where um, I have it, and then I... Um, Maybe Sonia can uh, look for it a little bit more quickly than I can, but um, okay. I think actually I did find it, so I now just need to get to the share screen and I can put it up just to see if anybody has um, any questions about it. So I think that it should be this it's fairly, fairly straightforward order. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that we had it. Um, we do need to vote on it. We can vote on it today. If, uh, if members of the committee are comfortable, it is not necessary. Um, because um, I think that the plan is for it to come before the council on the 29th of this month, which is the last Monday. Um, but it's fairly st straightforward order. So I um, wanted to have you have a chance to look at it and see if there are any questions about it. Andy, there, I don't know, did you share your screen yet? Because I'm not, there's nothing up yet. Oh. And when you tried to do agenda, it never did show. So we just all pretended we were looking at it. <laughs> That's interesting because I thought that I had done share and it, uh, we'll, we'll try again. Um, but, uh, let's see what we can, if we, uh, if that did it or not. It's working. It's starting. It's up now. Okay, so I'll just leave it for just a moment um, and see if there are any. Uh, so if anybody else can uh, note, notes that there's somebody who has a raised hand, I can't see it at the moment. Kathy has her hand. Kathy? You're muted still, Kathy.
Okay, um, my question is if we, when we vote on this, we still have enterprise funds scheduled for a review of the budget for the FY21, the full budget. Um, so this in effect sets the revenue stream for the fund and you, both these funds. And um, so in this voting, are we accepting kind of the whole package um, on the rates, which I think the answer is yes. And then when we talk about this in July, are we going to focus on out years, different variations, so not go into, you know, how many trucks are there, things like that, because in this year they're wiped out. So I'm just trying to understand the interaction between this decision and then the time slot we have for enterprise funds in July. You have to remember that we're in somewhat of an unusual year yeah, because I know. Uh, under normal circumstances, we would have had the budget to start reviewing um, by on May 1st, and we would be doing it during the month of May, and then we were, would be here into June setting the water rate, um, and it would be after the fact. This year, you're, you are correct. We are doing it in reverse order because we don't really have any choice. Um, I wasn't questioning reverse order. I was just trying to understand what we will be talking about when we come back to this in July because we've had a, a reasonable robust, you know, I have last year's budget book and it has a lot more information, you know, on how many people work on the fund, what they do. Electricity costs are really high um, on operating these funds. You know, we've got a lot of information in the budget book. So we'll, is that where we will focus in July? Um, so it's purely, I understand why we're doing it in reverse. Um, yeah, yeah we, we could focus on any, I mean, any questions that come up between now and then we can focus on. Um, we'll have the budget books ready and available and updated. Um, and I'm sure that we'll, we can go through as well some of, the, some of the data that's in the budget books on staffing and plans for the future. Um, there's also information on goals and um, progress made towards those, those goals and future goals and, and things of that nature. So um, we can review a lot of that information. Okay. That, that was my question because in my mind, we're basically setting the revenue parameters right now when, if, when we vote on the rates and then everything else is... And I'm partly asking this because, as you all know, we, we agreed that we'd take some focuses and um, each of us take an area of the budget and mine is enterprise funds. So I'm trying to reverse thing of what other questions will I have that won't have us just repeating what we just did, um, focus in different areas. Okay, that's helpful. Hey, Lynn? Um, yeah, a couple things. Um, the reality is we have to set these rates now, um, unlike a couple of other things we've been able to delay. But I actually would prefer that we go ahead and move on these today and um, make a motion. I don't have the number correct up there anymore. So maybe Andy, you wanna um, give me the words for the motion and it's, a, it's to recommend this order to the council. Um. The motion would probably be to uh, recommend um, proposed order FY21-10 water sewer rates to the council um, for approval. I so moved. I second. So there's a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, any discussion on the motion? I just want to say I'm astounded that we've been able to figure it out this way <laughs> and hopefully it will serve us throughout the year and we don't see any really serious deficit. But good work. And I, I had actually expected to see, I was doing a, how much the use had plunged. I, I expected to see, you know, 30% off or something. So it's down, but it's, it's not the magnitude I had uh, feared. So before we take a vote on it, there's one question and while we still have Guilford um, and Amy present is, uh, 
We had a lot of discussion that was very good on May 1st about water rates, and block rates, and different alternatives for rate structure. Do most communities have flat rates for sewer rates and um, are there alternatives, similar alternatives to the water rate that a uh, council might want to consider in future years? Most places charge a, a flat rate for sewer. Um, places that do not charge a flat rate have a, a very a much more varied um, infrastructure in town where they'll have more industry or they'll have more of a more different types of commercial bases that use water differently. Um, and those rates are usually um, set based on the strength of the wastewater that is given back to the wastewater facility, where if you're, if you're a food processor and you add a lot of uh, biological oxygen demand to the waste, you, you, they charge you more. Um, and it's basically the strength of the wastewater that sets those rates. So it's not something that we would likely consider here. Mm -hmm. No, no, although there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that stale beer causes the wastewater system not to work very well. And considering we're a very high beer uh, consumer, that might be something to think about. Yeah, but I won't get into the question of who you decide who to charge. Uh, uh, is there any other questions or um, particularly getting back to the motion that's uh, now been made and seconded. So seeing no request for comments, uh, do any of our um, resident members who will not be voting um, have anything that they would like to say at this point to indicate um, that they'd like reflected in the minutes regarding this motion? Seeing no hands on that, then I'm just gonna go through um, for a roll call vote is required because this is a uh, remote participation meeting. Uh, Pat, Hello, I just got unmuted. Oh, Hello. Dorothy. Sorry, I unmuted yeah, I you, Dorothy, because we're going to do a roll call vote. Okay, but I had done star nine several times. Um, oh. Did it? I so I don't think that worked. It I'm didn't sorry. make my. It didn't. I had done star nine four times. Oh. Um, so I, because I, I don't know what you see visually, but I'm just letting you, I'm just informing you that it didn't work. And I think I remember somebody else who came in on the phone in a, in a pe previous meeting, maybe not finance, said that it didn't work either. So I'm not sure it's a good system. Um, but okay, so I'm unmuted for the vote. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have questions I, I, you intended to ask? The... Well, I, I did, I did have a couple of questions. Um, number one, I'm surprised that the usage in June is the same as last June. Because I've been reading that local water and sewer rates are getting much more use now when people in quarantine. So that's a, a confusion. Um, I did want to say that I really like a lot of the way that the uh, water and sewer are being managed, which is, uh, I would say, visionary in that looking to see what is available, what taking advantage of possibilities when they can still get them, which involves keeping that other plant up, and being aware of future needs. Um, but and it also also not not trying to sell the old uh, thickener belt, but keeping it as a backup. So I like those conservative and yet visionary aspects. But I I am worried about cutting the OPEB as much as you are because the answer that Sean gave was not that we're giving enough. It was we're giving what was required, and what is required is way too low to ever keep be up to date on OPEB things. And there's always some reason to not pay OPEB, like all those trucks that are being deferred now. So I, I guess I would prefer not to make that big a cut in the OPEB. But I think I got this hung up. You know, um, yep. can you hear, you can still hear? I can hear you, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, we're hearing you too, so okay. do, not, do not fear. Um, yeah, I, I had these questions way back in the, at the appropriate time yeah, no, in the no, I, session, uh, the, well, one was I uh, um, appreciate the kind words that you had to say on behalf of those who are managing the, the system, but you did have a couple of questions in there too. One was you said you were surprised about usage um, and the fact that usage is coming up in June, even with the university 
um, shut down because you thought that um, uh, people are home. They're not going out. They're not going to work. They're you know they're they're home. And I in many other communities, there's an increase of water and sewer rates um, because people are in their homes. Rates or usage? She, I think she meant usage. You. Usage. I meant yeah. usage. Yeah. Well, well, right now usage is normal, and it's because people are home and all the students are gone. Um, every year in May, the students leave, and we're left with the, the population that's usually here the year round. So that's why we're mm -hmm. pretty much at normal usage right now. Okay, but I, but you know, we have certainly been home using our own water and sewer way more than we would normally. So I just thought other people would be too. But um, is that okay? Um, the my other point that I had really was. Besides, I was appreciating the uh, forward-looking and yet conservative practices, but was wanting to be a little more conservative on, on the OPEB because that's the, the amount that you have to put in is never going to get you there. It's like the, the minimum that you pay on a credit card. It's never going to get your um, principal paid down. Yeah. Um, so coming from the finance world, we never like to cut things like contingencies and building for the future. So. Um, we, you know, we didn't look at it this year because we do feel that the, this is sort of a temporary blip. Uh, hopefully the consumption will recover and we can get back on track um, in the very near future. Yeah. Um, but so we still are making a contribution. We didn't cut it completely. Um, right. And when we do get it back up to where it is, again, we're, we're sort of not where it's supposed to be on an annual basis um, or it has been for several years and then we'll get it back there as soon as we can. Okay. But supposed to be is full funding. And I, I know that supposed to be is not always called full funding. It's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of practices in OPEB which are not really solid is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a large liability um, that with most large liabilities, you make a plan to, to fully fund it over, you know, many years. Um, and so the, yeah. our enterprise funds have been doing a good job of stick into a plan. Um, I just think this is such an unusual year that we, we had to be. Yeah. We probably should have a full OPEB discussion as a part of the general budget discussion when we're looking at the FY21 budget as a whole. Well, the other uh, thing, we're in the process of doing our, um, getting our OPEB update as well. Um, we're working with our actuaries right now to get our our liability revalued and all those reports. Um, so we can talk about OPEB in the near future. We'll also be able to bring you back an updated report. Um, oh, so very nice. Right. Very good. I, I, I think that's really important, Andy, too, because the practice, since this is really paying, um, it's putting money into reserves and the practice in the United States, I mean, we are still paying people's retiree health benefits where it's a pay as it's been pay as you go. So trying to explain what it is and what it isn't would be good. Um, and to talk about what the corporate world isn't isn't doing on this um, in terms of pre funding or what the Medicare program itself is and isn't doing on this. You know, just doing it. I just think it would be a good discussion just for, to g provide a context for what OPEB is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a complex subject and it's one that's worth having for this committee because uh, Mary Lou and Sharon and I, being on, having been on the prior finance committee, had some involvement in that discussion previously, uh, going back to Sandy Pooler and uh, but it's been a while and there's a lot of uh, those of you who have not had that discussion is what is a long range plan? Um, because it really is in part balanced out against uh, the retirement fund. And of course the other question is whether the retirement fund um, is not going to be fully paid as quickly as we'd originally anticipated and how those two balance out. Uh, and that's a mm -hmm. off complex topics. So we had a motion on the floor, let's get on with it and then we can uh, move into the capital plan. Um, so I'm gonna do a roll call vote. Um, Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Um, Lynn Guzmer? 
Yes. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. And I'm voting yes, so it's five to zero. And um, we have now recommended the order. Uh, so let's turn to the capital plan. Uh, so I don't know, Paul, the starter, Sean, you just want to jump in and uh, describe it. So um, I can bring up the same presentation as of last night, or I can just describe um, the plan. Um, essentially, the recommendation uh, for FY21 was to put um, $530,000 in roads, $170,000 into sidewalks, uh, $62,000 um, would come from other revenues and that would be used for downtown improvements. Um, and then we would also have the chapter 90 money, which is about $800,000. Um, if it's approved by the state, um, that could be used for roads as well. Um, would it be helpful if I bring up that presentation from last night, Andy, or do we just want to um, answer questions? I'll let other people, if somebody else requests, otherwise we can just keep going. And uh, Dorothy, if uh, you need to ask a question, uh, because we were having the problem with raised hands, say something verbally. I think it was my fault because I had left her on allowed to talk. So I've um, fixed that. So the star nine function should be working again. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so does yeah, anybody yeah. want to- I'll share my screen, Andy, just to get the okay. projects on the screen. So for those of you who were at the meeting last night or watched it, this is the presentation from last night to the council, which was then referred back to us. <coughs> so as you can see, and, you see, and if you've read Paul's memo, it, it's um, explained pretty clearly within the memo, the budgeted reserve, and then the rest for roads and um, sidewalks downtown. Is that you're calling it downtown improvements here? Yeah, I mean, so so the, we anticipate that some of it will be sidewalks, but there may be other improvements um, to the to the um, downtown like lighting and uh, ride sh uh, bicycle sharing and things like that. And this is the full plan. Um, Andy, do you, would you like me to pull up the order for this? Uh, in a minute, let's see if there are any questions. Just give a moment to get questions and then pull up the order that goes with it. Bob? Yeah, thanks. I, I just have a general question about the specific projects that are going to be funded. And the question is, how are those prioritized? I mean, I, I understand where the budget comes from, but once we have the budget, then we're going to work on specific projects. And what's the process for prioritizing that? Is that come out of the JCPC or is that done through uh, Mr. Bachelman's office or um, Mr. Mooring's office. Andy, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, why don't you go with it, Sean? Uh, so there's sort of what happens in a normal year, and then there's what happened this year. Um, so in a normal year, um, there's a lot of work that's done by all the department heads around their five-year plans and the projects they, they, they want for the upcoming year, or requesting for the upcoming year. Um, they meet with the town manager and the finance office, and we develop sort of a preliminary plan and then that plan is presented to the Joint Capital Planning Committee where we look for their um, recommendation. And usually the requests outweigh the funding sources. So there is a prioritization that um, has to happen in order to get the request down to what we can actually fund. And so that does happen at the JCPC level on a normal year. And then that recommendation is made to the town manager and he has a certain amount of time to you know, review the recommendation from JCPC, see if it's in alignment with what he's hearing and what he his vision is for the future, um, and then he'll make the final decision on what's uh, what the capital improvement program looks like and what's presented to the town council 
um, who ultimately will, will vote on that capital improvement program. So in a normal year, um, there is some prioritization that happens before joint capital planning committee, then there's a lot that happens during that, that point. Um, and then even more that happens once it goes to the town manager. Uh, this year, um, there were only a couple specific projects that were approved because there, the funding was so limited compared to what it normally is. It's about half of what it normally is. Um, so the only specific projects um, that came from cash capital, which is uh, what we typically focus most of our attention on, um, are roads and sidewalks. And the reason why we prioritize roads and sidewalks is because we know that no matter you know, for the most part, regardless of what happens with universities or our local elementary and middle and high school um, and with stay at home orders and things like that in the fall, um, which we don't know what that'll look like yet, we still can proceed with work on roads and sidewalks. And combining that with just knowing how high a priority ro roads and sidewalks have been for the town, uh, we thought it was prudent to keep making progress on roads and sidewalks and not fall behind. Um, and then you'll, so the, the rest of the money that was available after roads and sidewalks, we put into the capital reserve fund. And for now, it's going to be there as sort of a safety net in case there's any urgent projects that uh, come up in the next few months. And our plan is for the joint capital planning committee to get back together in the fall um, and potentially allocate funds from that capital reserve to specific projects. If we feel like things have stabilized in the local economy and things are starting to come back. Um, if not, we may want to keep that capital reserve for the rest of the year. Um, so, there, so really, there will be much more work done in the fall than what we typically do. Um, we don't typically meet that early with the Joint Capital Planning Committee, but since this is an unusual year, um, we are going to have to come back and revisit the plan in the fall. Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Sean said, which was excellent. Bob, you would normally see lots of line items here, a truck, uh, a boiler system. So in the um, JCPC report, working with stat staff, include, of course, Sean was leading it, um, we set up some criteria for what would rise to the top for use of that reserve. And then uh, Paul is put in charge of the reserve, but he has to, my understanding is he would have to come to the council to be actually spending out of it. Um, so it's, it's both a decision making on what rises to the top. So some of the things that were postponed or delayed were bets that um, they could be replaced, but they could last a year. You know, they weren't at the, it's going to fail. So there were some potential things that are at risk. So that's the come back to it in the fall. And this, uh, people should correct me, this was, this is a one-time way of handling it is what we were faced with, with setting up the reserve fund by 22. We may or may not have the money that's projected here, but we could start earlier and yeah. be back, be back to saying, here is the list of things that we're recommending. Yep, that, that was definitely the intent. Yeah. So, um, I thought that the, uh, plan was is that Paul would report proposed expenditures to the council, but that uh, it was not set up to require council approval to make the expenditures. Uh, Sonia, Sonia can probably weigh in, but I think what we had settled on is that because the capital reserve isn't, doesn't, isn't, doesn't have enough specificity in terms of it's not targeted towards any specific projects, that we would want to bring it to the council um, for approval for whatever specific projects need to be funded. Um, and then we would report any of those expenditures to the Joint Capital Planning Committee in the fall to you know, bring them up to speed um, with what projects have been funded from the capital reserve. But um, we do anticipate at this point that if we do need to spend from that capital reserve, we would bring it to the council. Um, and again, it would typically be on an urgent basis. So it's not something we necessarily are planning to do at this point, but um, that, that, that was the plan last I'd uh, last we discussed it. Yeah, Sean, I'll add to that. Um, we, we're actually required to go back for an appropriation at, um, with the council. It's just a budgeted reserve, kind of like a free cash that goes away at the end of June, at the, at the end of the fiscal year. So you do have to go to council with, a, with a, um, an appropriation to spend it. Even uh... But it's not a new appropriation, so you don't have to do all the public forums and all that to respend it. it. It's been it's been 
budgeted for this purpose? Well, let's go, let's bring up the order because then I can, uh, we both can get it on the screen and I can uh, ask my follow up question on that just to make sure that we all understand it. I'm going to bring it up right now. Um, does that look okay or should I try to fix the view? No, I think that's okay. Uh, actually gets the whole thing onto one page. Uh, then I'm going to have to go back in a second look at the participant list, but I get to my point first. The order lists a capital program in the uh, boxes that are in the table that's below. And uh, it talks about equipment, building facilities, but it's all listed under facilities. Right, because it's, right, because it's just yeah. roads and sidewalks. Yeah. Facility is a sort of a term that's been used in the past that's not great, just not a great descriptive uh, term that, but it typically covered the non-building, non-equipment um, projects. So facilities was sort of the catch-all for everything else. And that's what you did this year. Yeah. And last, year, last year in town meetings, there was always sequential votes on equipment, facilities, and uh, buildings. Right. And it was, then there was a listing of what was below, but I had been always under the understanding that the town manager um, if there was uh, an overage in one item and, and another item came in at a different price, that it never had to go back to anybody because um, it was just as long as it fit into the category for which it was appropriated equipment, building, or facilities. Uh, I'll let Sonia Sonia uh, describe that more. I know for on the on the school side, you know, we ha we had budgets for specific projects. And if you um, came in under, then you would turn that back. Um, you turn whatever was left over back, and then that could eventually be reappropriated. But I'll let Sonia um, describe that. No, Andy, you're correct. The way we used to vote um, at town meeting is we would vote three separate categories. Um, and as long, and you would have a list under each category. And if one was over, Costs more and one came in under you you had the flexibility to move that within those projects um, now we vote it as one number in all categories which gives us even even more flexibility but what we are voting here is a budgeted reserve which is meant for us to be able to go back and appropriate from some if an emergent came from it's a funding source it's different than voting it to a separate project Okay, um, so trying to see if I can figure out where the, the roads don't fit in under a specific, uh, you didn't have a separate listing. Roads are, under, roads are under facilities. Everything is under facilities. Then. Yeah, and again, facilities doesn't mean, I mean, at least the way it's been in the past, it doesn't mean facilities. Okay. You, you would think, you know, facilities and buildings are sort of synonyms, but that's not the way JCPC and <laughs> has been done in the past. Right. Um, I stayed with the program. It probably should be infrastructure if we were being correct. How would other communities have dealt with it within their orders? Roads and sidewalks would typically be infrastructure. Okay, um, and then the, the last, I'm gonna ask one additional question then to see I, nobody else has raised hands right now. <clears throat> um, I thought that I had read on the MMA website within the past week that uh, 
the legislature is working on chapter 90 and that there even there's even discussion about a 50% increase and yeah i mean last i saw was i think the senate the senate of the house did approve the increase but it's not um it's not finalized yet it's still got to be voted by the other um the senate of the house and then ultimately approved into the budget so if that was actually approved in that fashion with the 50 percent increase would that equal a 50 percent increase for every city and town or is there a formula that uh, might skew that additional fund distribution i don't know is guilford still in the is he still in the room probably not um, i am not sure about that but we can get that answer yeah because uh I mean, the only difference it would make is since we know we have to use it for a purpose, it would increase available funds for the purposes that we can use Chapter 94. Right. Yep. Kathy, you're muted. I'm doing it. Um, thank you, Andy, for uh, focusing on this table. So since facilities is code word for roads and sidewalks. It's <laughs> not a new thing, just for the record. That's not No, 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 but, but what we all think is in that line is roads and sidewalks based on the table. Yep. Um, does this, um, since I also know at the JCPC discussion, the reason, the strong reason for, for breaking them out was that we can then start contracting in July and August and get some of this work done, you know, when the season allows it. Um, does the town manager with this language, would there be an ability to spend that line on a facility rather than roads and sidewalks? Or does this allocate it specifically? Because I'm looking over on the other side, the words, it says installation of replacement of equipment, repair or improvement of buildings. Um, it actually doesn't ever say roads and sidewalks um, anywhere over here, you know, on the, on the words. So I'm just wondering whether, given the unusualness of this year, do we need to, in the B, the order, at least have the words um, roads and sidewalks, street repair, something there? Um, because installation of new or replacement equipment or repair or improvement of buildings or the repair or improvement of facilities so that, that's my question. Um, I don't think Paul would be spending it on anything else because the roads and sidewalks are so urgent. I can answer some of that. Um, in the past, well, even in the present, whatever is in the JCPC, the, usually the breakdown of what our capital program is in the JCPC, and it gets booked by that breakdown. So in our general ledger, it will get booked the way the JCPC report spells it out with the adjustment that Paul made, of course, with his recommendation. So you will see that under roads and you will see the, the um, other amount under um, sidewalks. And that, and we can only move money around to projects that are, were listed in the JCPC report. Okay. So it's not, it, we can't just spend it on anything else. No, I didn't think so. And it's, as you said, Paul's memo, JCPC actually spent somewhat less on the road sidewalk category and more on reserve, but his cover memo explained that he was going back to a 50% split. So that, that and, modifies the JCPC uh, wording a bit, right. you know, just dollar amount. Yeah. And our auditors and the DOR, they, they go through all of this. They go through the reports and um, all of our, financials have to pretty much reflect what the report okay. said. So it's, there's not a lot of moving around. Okay. So are there any other questions that people have about the entire subject, including proposed order 21-05A um, capital program? I'm just gonna unmute Dorothy in case She's having trouble again. So, uh, no, I, I have no other questions. I think Kathy asked the ones I would have asked. Okay. In um, more detail. So again, uh, this is not on a council agenda until 
the 29th. So if people want more time, they can have it. On the other hand, if they feel that there's sufficient understanding from last night's uh, meeting and forum and from uh, today's discussion to go forward, um, we could have a motion to recommend appropriation order 20 FY 2105A to the town council. Lynn, I see your hand up. So moved. <laughs> Second, DeAngelis. <laughs> okay, there's been a motion that's made, been made and seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? Um, I assume that Lynn's hand being up is just because it was up from before. Lynn, did you have anything else you want to say? No, I, I'm trying to lower my hand, but I don't think okay. I can. Uh, All right. Um, is there anything that any of uh, the resident members of the committee would like to say before I uh, do a roll call vote regarding the motion on the floor? Seeing um, no request for comments, um, I'll go through um, and we'll do a roll call vote on the motion to uh, recommend to the Council Appropriation Order 21 dash 05A. So, uh, Pat? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. And I'm voting yes. So again, it's five to zero. And we have recommended that. Uh, the other thing that was on the agenda and um, as far as appropriations is concerned was that we still have the regional school proposal and uh, we do have an or uh, at least one order for that there's actually uh, maybe one missing but uh, Kathy you had asked some questions of um, Sean Sean had done some investigation regarding um, the funds that had been referred to in the presentation. Did, um, just a question of whether you wanted to explain what you had asked to the yep. uh, yeah, the no, no, he, he was terrific. We, we, last time Lynn had asked some questions, we, we'd focus on, we heard about a, a bunch of different kinds of reserve funds. One uh, for <laughs> special ed, one for capital, and then a more general. So. I said, could you tell us what's actually in each of them? Um, you know, and was I missing any? So uh, Sean checked with Doug and um, I'll, I can read them off. And then what I could do is just forward the email that Sean sent to me to everyone. So you have it in your records, but the capital Stab stabilization fund has about $475,000 in it. The special ed stabilization fund has 98,000 and the more general uh, emergency and other fund has 1.253 million, which is about 3.8% of the total budget. Um, so I will forward that because I think it's good information for us to have when we're thinking of the regional school budget overall. Um, so if you add them all up, you get to, you get to about 1.8 million, but two of them are restricted to only be used in, um, only be used for capital and only be used for special ed. So there's only one general reserve, the way we would think of reserve that has literally been called that. Um, if, uh, and is, am I right to the extent the end of the year budget for the regional school districts come in under, that would be free cash or that would be, where, where would, you know, when the yeah. final accounting happens. Yeah, E&D um, is the general reserve that you described, and that stands for excess and deficiency. And so okay. that, act, that acts as the free cash for the region. So whenever revenues come in higher than they budgeted, or if expenses come in lower than what they budgeted, whatever that difference is at year end um, goes to E&D. And it has to be certified just like the town gets its free cash certified. There's a report that... Um, has to be done for the Department of Revenue and they ask for all this information and they check all the numbers. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's pretty much identical to free cash just for a regional school district. Okay. Any questions on that or other questions that people have regarding the region budget? 
There are three pieces Lynn, to Lynn the- has her hand up, Andy. I finally did it. Oh, okay. Lynn. Um, so, Andy, can we just recount when the other town meeting, or when the town meetings are for the three towns and what we know about them? Uh, we know two of them are the last Saturday of the month, that's the 27th. 7th, okay. That's Shutesbury and Pelham. And um, have you heard a date for Loveridge yet, Sean? I have not, um, but I'm going to look it up right now and see if there's anything about it. Yeah. yeah they post something on their website because um, I talked to their select board chair, uh, but that's been several weeks ago and they had not as a then. So this says that their um, annual town meeting is June 20th at 9 a.m. outside of the library school. So they have scheduled and they, so they're going first. Yep. We're scheduled uh, to vote it on the 29th. Um, so we could make a recommendation at any time. I did see um, a proposed order for the assessment method. I'm not sure that I saw a proposed order for the uh, appropriation or budget approval. So I've got it right here. Andy, I'll share my screen again. Yeah, all three of them are together. You just need to scroll them down. Oh, okay. So this first one is the assessment method. Um, I'll come back to it. The second one is the, the budget itself. And the last one, if, um, you know, depending on how the finance committee and the council want to proceed, is the debt authorization. And I'll go back to the top. So um, this, actually go to the second one for a second because I wanted to make sure. Um, so it's, this is the one that's the budget approval. Yep. Uh, so we don't actually have an order that appropriates the funds in the dollar. Or is, is it involved here? Yes. Yeah. This has the this 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 outlines the total budget for the region, but also the Amherst share based on the assessment method okay. above. It's got it in the second line. It's pretty yeah, small, print, but it's sitting there. I can make it a little bigger, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then the third one is uh, go down to the capital. Yep, and the third one is the debt authorization for what the school committee um, approved for capital for next year. And this is the one that if we do nothing, we're bound to it anyway. Yeah, so if you don't act on this within 60 days of when it was voted, which was May 26th, um, then it, it's considered to be approved by that town. So if none of the towns act on it, then it's approved. So we can either approve it or do nothing and it has, the, either of those have the same function. Right, and this was this was reduced quite a bit from their original vote. Um, so my understanding is this really kind of represents their highest priority for capital projects. Okay. Questions from the committee. Uh, go back to make sure that I can spot any. Lynn. I guess, Andy, this just goes back to that question of do we want to be voting before town, the other town meetings? Um, so the council, the council won't be. Right? No. The, yeah, the council would be holding off unless we move to the council vote to a different date. No, we'll keep the council on the 29th. Yeah. Um, there's no reason. Uh, because there's nothing binding. We haven't bound the uh, town if the finance committee makes a recommendation beforehand. 
the difficulty we're going to have is that two of the town meetings, if we want to wait to see what other town, what the town meetings do, the finance committee won't necessarily be meeting between the afternoon of the 27th and the um, evening of the 29th. Right, because we're meeting on the 23rd, so we would still be before the town, two of the towns are meeting. Right. Uh, or we could have a quick finance committee vote at six o'clock on the 29th. Yeah, I just want to throw out there that we were kind of hoping that we wouldn't have to have a, a finance committee meeting next week <laughs> so that we could get through the budget book. Since there's, we voted the sewer rates already and we don't right. really. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, I always kind of come back to this. I don't, I don't really know if it matters because every town's going to be voting on this exact same language. Um, this is what the school committee approved. So whether you wait to see how they vote, you're still going to have to vote on this language. Um, and if, if for this language to get modified, the school committee would have to change what they, you know, what they're going to give to the, to the towns. Okay. So I think that the only thing that would cause us to even consider different results would be if one of the other towns we happen to know voted no on the assessment method and then um, required us to go to the statutory method, would that cause us to do anything different? Um, I don't think it would, again, if that happened, the budget would essentially fail because the, the school committee voted specific assessments and that's what you're voting here. And so if they were to switch methods, the, you, you wouldn't be voting this assessment amount. It would be something completely different. Um, and again, that would the school committee voted um, to my, you know, they did it the same way they've done in the past, which I believe they did. Um, they vote a specific method when they vote the budget. They say, this is the budget and this is the method that we are approving. Um, so essentially, the, the, the other towns don't vote whether or not to do the statutory method. They vote whether to do the alternative method. And if, right. that, if that fails, it goes back to school committee. And you're not picking up any waves out of any of the other, any of the three towns? Not for this year. I mean, all when with the COVID-19 and the level of funding of the budget, um, I believe all the other towns ended up at even better off than where they were before because Amherst assessment was brought down to being level with what it was prior. And for the other towns, I believe that dropped them all even more. Um, so I, don't, I haven't heard anything um, for FY21. Um, and I believe, uh, you know, the one town that sort of set out some guidance, I believe Shootsbury had set out some guidance of a certain level of reduction that they um, were expecting. Um, and I believe that the assessment that they are voting on satisfies that uh, guidance that they provided. And we should go ahead and move. Yep. Do you want me to so, go to the top, Andy? Do you want to so do the separate votes or do you want to do them all three together? I was wondering if we could do them all three together, if there's a way to word it to, because they're all under 2103, aren't they? Uh, 2101. 2102 and 2103. Uh, so, yeah, last one, 2103. And they all had separate numbers just like last year. I mean, we could, I can make that amendment if you want. No, we don't need to. I think we can, uh, we could probably do a vote in a single motion that um, whether the Finance Committee recommends to the Council approval of orders 21, FY2101, FY2102, and FY2103. That could be made as a single motion. So moved. So there's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Any comments from members, the resident members of the committee before we vote? 
seeing no requests for recognition, I'll go through roll call vote. I'm just going to do it in the same order that I did it before. Uh, Pat? Yes. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. And I'm voting yes. So it's again five to zero. And uh, I think that takes care of the three orders that were being presented. And I therefore um, just need to go back for a moment to the um, agenda, which I'm not at the moment sharing. So uh, see if there was anything else that we had wanted to talk about. Um, there is no public to have public comment today. Um, the one thing that we didn't list, if we're not going to meet next week, um, then there's two consequences. One is that I have to notify ECAC that it's not an available week and I will be willing to do that. The other thing that I wanted to just mention briefly is that um, we had assigned um, to have people be prepared to ask questions when the um, budget came forward to spend a little bit more time on each section. Um, and uh, I'm not going to name names or point to anyone, but it's come to my attention that somebody already jumped the gun and asked questions based upon the FY20 budget. And uh, that hadn't been anticipated. Um, and uh, I think uh, caught the uh, staff on surprise because it was an anticipated method. Um, what we were really looking for is to, and I want everybody to keep going forward. It was helpful. I'm sure to the individual that they were able to get some understanding, but what we were trying to do is be efficient, as efficient as possible with the um, meetings that we're going to have with each department had to have one person who is going to at least have gone through the budget in detail, really understand it and really be prepared to ask good questions at the meeting. Um, I don't, it, this, is, this is a question for um, Sean and Sonia. If somebody has developed questions in advance, is it better to send them to the department heads through you in advance or should it wait till the meeting? Um, yeah, I would encourage you to, if you have your questions or first round of questions, um, yeah, you can send them to Sonia or I, and we can make sure they get to the department heads. Um, I suggest in advance that they'll just, it'll give them more time to prepare a robust response to whatever the question is. Um, so yeah, I would, I would suggest if you have them in advance, get them to us and we'll, we'll make sure the department heads are thinking about them. Okay. Um, Mary Lou had, uh, done a little bit of a memo and I don't know if, the, if it got around to everybody, Mary Lou. You have your hand up. I think it is also important that any questions we submit to Sean or Sonia that they also go to you, so you know kind of what's out there, what's going on. Uh, I think that's really critical. So I'm going to put forward that suggestion. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate that. So why don't we do that? But uh, let's make sure they got all three and then uh, Sean and Sonia can determine whether they have answers based upon their own knowledge already or whether they need to forward it to the um, other staff who might be helpful in answering the questions. But if you do have anything that's available in advance, what's going to happen, of course, is that by uh, 29th, we're going to get the uh, budget book uh, that will come from Paul at the council meeting on that Monday. And then uh, at that point, we'll be able to go through the FY21 budget book and tailor our questions very specifically to that budget book. And we all know the schedule. Uh, it's been posted. 
uh, and, uh, so if you're trying to get it in advance, those who are on the first day um, have a little bit of a tighter timeline. Um, Tuesday is just general questions and uh, that there's, that's because it's so quickly after that there's no way to prepare for uh, do the kind of preparation that we're talking about here. Um, and of course, as always, <clears throat> every member of the committee should be looking at every section of the budget and be asking questions about the budget. Any questions or comments about process beyond that, Kathy? I'm just, I'm looking at the schedule um, so that right after Paul gives us the budget, the next day, June 30th, has elementary schools and libraries. So that's going to be the people focusing on that, that's going to be the tightest turnaround. They will have just gotten the budget the day before. Is it, so we are focusing on two areas that day, correct? I'm just confirming. That's what's listed yeah. on my piece here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's actually an interesting question because when it was done, um, it was done with the thought that the budgets have already been submitted to the library trustees and the school committee and therefore are available already. Um, will we be getting them before the 29th? Asking, are you asking me? Yes. Um, if we can make them available sooner, we will. Um, it is sort of a unusual year where we are kind of crunch time right now trying to get them together um, and get them reviewed and um, by everybody that needs to review them. So if we are able to get them out sooner, we will, um, but I, it'll, it'll depend on sort of our, our process as we go. Because Mary Lou can help out with this. Uh, in prior years, what would happen back in the uh, town meeting days is the uh, school committee would approve the elementary budget or the library trustees, uh, the library budget and that was well in advance of the town meeting. And it, but of course, the difference was it didn't go through the town manager. Right. Um, right. That's correct. And you could do that. And that was very helpful. Um, and as I'm looking at this schedule for July, are there any departments that are fairly easy to look at and, and ask questions. I would say getting the school budget on the 30th isn't going to give me any time to look at some of that information. That's a heavy budget. Um, and the library is also. So are there any other departments such as um, on the 7th, you have scheduled um, the enterprise funds. Is that something that's relatively easy to, to talk about and ask questions? And are there other areas of the manager's budget that could be kind of first on the finance committee's agenda and then the, the ones that require more questions come later? Um, the one thing I'll just add is that we have sort of coordinated with department heads already on what days they are um, going to be presenting to try to make sure that everyone's available during that time because again we're not usually we're not usually doing budgets in July so it's typically time when uh, department heads may take a vacation or, or take some time off um, so as of right now we do have all the department heads lined up for their days um, if we were to change it um, we just we'd have to go back and make sure that they're still available um, the question of that I started with actually is if the library trustees, and I use them as an example, have approved a budget, even though um, town manager hasn't signed off on it to include in this budget, is there a reason why it could not be made available to us as the budget submitted by the library trustees? because they will have done it in open meeting. Um, I don't think so. Um, I'll let Sonia weigh in if she knows of anything, but same thing with the elementary schools. Um, I probably should know this, but if the, you know, if the elementary school committee votes their budget, um, 
somebody could start looking at that as soon as they vote their budget. So um, those are all public documents when they're shared at those meetings. So we leave it as a request. Um, the, since Paul is not in the meeting any more at the moment, make it a request. Um, and uh, if Paul has no objection, do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we can. Does, uh, no. Okay. Okay, I'll Me contact. Well, no, let John will take care of it. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll talk to him tomorrow and just, you know, I don't, I don't. Uh, expect that he'll have any issue with again just sharing those documents ahead of time um, so that people can get a head start on looking at those. So what, is, what is do you know the date when the school committee is voting that budget? The school committee? Yeah. Um, I can look on their calendar. I was wondering if they already did. I'm not um, not yep. in that world anymore, but let me, I will find out and just um, find out the date. They, again, they yeah. may have already voted it. Uh, normally region elementary schools always sort of voted around the same time, um, but I'll double check um, tomorrow and I'll let you know. Andy? When did they uh, have to present it to the manager? They would have voted it before they send it forward. Yep, yeah, yeah, once they vote it, it sort of automatically gets sent forward to the town manager. And there is a requested date um, that for submission to the manager, the council actually established the date because it's part of the charter. Uh, I just don't want to recall what it is right now. The only question I have is, can we begin doing this if, so we're suggesting we could look at it before the council has actually transferred it to the finance committee? Um, I don't think that we, um, what we would be looking at is a document that has been approved by the school committee and by the library trustees. Um, it is not something that um, we're looking at that is uh, being officially referred to us. We're looking at a document that others, that another body has approved. And if there's a variation, um, so then we'll have to deal with it. However, in reality, there is gonna be no variation. Okay. So it looks like from the calendar that I'm looking at, Andy, that um, finance, I'm going to see that it already went to the council and it was referred to the finance committee, the region budget. No, not the region budget. We're talking about the elementary. Okay. The elementary and the, the library. There. Those would not be, those only would get to us officially through the town manager's budget under this current form of government. Mm -hmm. In the prior form of government, they went directly to the finance committee but that's not where we are anymore. Okay. But I think Sean understands what we're, what the question is. And yeah, I don't see it. Again, once they're discussed at, at the, like the schools, for example, once it's approved by the school committee, um, whether it's been referred or not, you sort of, it's there. You can look at it um, to see what the school committee voted. Okay, um, Lynn and then Bob. I've already spoken. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to know what the timing is on when the manager's budget will be available on the 29th. Is it after the meeting, um, prior to the meeting? Um, I think we typically try to send it out at least a little bit before the meeting as a PDF so people can start looking at it. Um, so it, we'll talk to Paul today or tomorrow and try to find out what he's comfortable with in terms of timing before, um, but I anticipate it'll go out at least a little bit before the meeting so that people can start taking a look at it. Okay, can, can I request that it be sent to the three uh, resident members of the finance committee? Because we normally don't get information okay. that, that directly. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Because if not, I think that I we've... 
Sharon's. Hello? Sharon. Um, can I also, are, will there also be um, paper copies, hard copies of the, that available or sent out? The, um, of the full budget document? Yes. I think we stopped doing that. Um, Sonia, what did, what was the, what happened last year? We got hard copies. You get hard copies? Yeah. Um, I, I would like a hard copy if they are available. Me too. Okay. Me too. Trying to save money with binding, but we'll consider it. <laughs> yeah, I think they were uh, produced in a much more limited manner and uh, they weren't in three ring binders anymore. Okay. If I recall. Yeah, no, that's um, that's why I did the visual. It's got this simple little thing that if you open it too many times, it falls apart, but it does work when you're not opening it all the time. <laughs> okay, Sean, you get to tell Holly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Because if not, then I think that we are, have um, actually exhausted the agenda and um, have no reason to meet next week. I will notify ECAC accordingly. And uh, Andy, did I just see you or talk to you for a couple of minutes at, after people leave? Yeah, or you want to just call me on the phone? Uh, I have another meeting coming up really fast, so this is easier. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Are we adjourned? Okay. So I think the meeting, therefore, is adjourned. And uh, it's uh, 4.40, 4.40 p.m. and we're adjourned. <laughs>